Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this, our sixth linkage webinar. Um, and I have to say it is again my immense honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Ian Balfour Lin, who will be giving us our talk today. Dr. Balfour Lin, he is a consultant um, until his very recent retirement in March in pediatric respiratory medicine from the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. There he was a tertiary pediatric respiratory consultant and he was director of the Royal Brompton's pediatric cystic fibrosis unit for over 14 years. He has multiple publications within the field um, on clinical aspects of cystic fibrosis and its treatment. His other work has included being the chairman of the cystic fibrosis group in the European Respiratory Society, and he was also president of the British Pediatric Respiratory Society and sat on the NHS on NHS England's clinical reference group, where he represented pediatric respiratory pediatric um, respiratory medicine and cystic fibrosis. So today's talk, Dr. Balfour Lin will discuss both the natural history of cystic fibrosis and how it has been revolutionized by gene targeted therapies. Be these the early ones, such as either CAFTER through to the triple therapy with CAFTRIO. So, without further ado, let me introduce Ian for the this our sixth linkage webinar. Fine. So, thank you very much. Um, yes, as as you've just heard, um, I have retired full time, but I'm still doing a half a day with the CF unit at the Royal Brompton Hospital, and I've seen from being a medical student until now the most immense change in the whole world of cystic fibrosis and um, that's what I'm going to be sort of sharing with you. So it's an old disease um, but having said that it's not that old. Uh, there was an old folklore about woe is a child kissed on a brow who tastes salty for he's cursed and soon must die and it's true if you lick a baby with cystic fibrosis they do taste salty. Um, Disease itself wasn't described till 1938, so less than 100 years ago, and it was based around the disease of the pancreas at that time. It wasn't until the early 80s that it was understood to be an epithelial dysfunction, and uh, shortly after they realised it was to do with chloride secretion um, and ultimately CFTR, which is a uh, iron channel chloride ion channel on the apical surface of secretory cells, so for example on the airways, pancreatic ducts, bile ducts in the liver, um, they don't work properly. And on the left is a normal um, epithelium and you look at the red blob which is CFTR and uh, it allows chloride out the cell onto the fluid lining the cell surface and, and then ENAC, the sodium channel, allows sodium in. And in the case of a CF cell, the red blob, the iron channel does not work at the surface, it sometimes doesn't even get there. So chloride can't get out of the cell, meaning too much sodium and water get into the cell. Consequently, the secretions inside the body are sticky and thick, and uh, bacteria love to grow there. Now, the sweat gland is different to the epithelial cells and there chloride and sodium are meant to be getting in the chloride to the channel. The chloride can't get into the cell, um, so the sodium can't get in as efficiently, uh, but water goes in more. And the reason for that importance is that the sweat test is how we make the diagnosis and we're measuring sweat chloride levels which, as you can see, because it can't get into the cell, there's more coming out and uh, a high sweat chloride is diagnostic. Normal level is under 30 millimoles per litre and the CF children usually range from about 90 to 110. I'm not going to go into the grey area where it's between 30 and 60, which is an intermediate level and can still be cystic fibrosis and it's a bit more complicated for us to diagnose. The reason that I'm going on about the sweat test is because it's a fantastic marker of CFTR function. So when we're looking at these new drugs, 
the sweat chloride is a very important outcome measure for a trial aside from clinical aspects. In terms of the genetics, um, we know it was autosomal recessive from the mid 40s and in the UK, one in 25 are carriers. That means about one child in every classroom is a carrier. Um, it obviously varies to an extent on ethnicity and it's a disease principally of Western Europe, North America. Um, nobody knows why there are so many carriers. There's theory about the chloride channel protecting you from cholera, and that in the old and the days when cholera was rife, um, you didn't lose as much fluid and you had a greater survival aspect. It's a speculation. Um, it wouldn't explain really why, for example, in the Indian subcontinent, whilst we see cystic fibrosis, it's, it's much less common. The breakthrough in 1989 from Lachi, Chewy and Francis Collins principally uh, was discovering the gene for CFTR on chromosome 7. Now, the complication is there are about 2,000 gene mutations recognised for CFTR but they don't all cause disease. Currently about 300 are disease causing, and some will have varying clinical consequence, meaning you have cystic fibrosis, but in a kind of milder version of it. And CFTR2.org is the uh, database where you can look up a particular person's gene mutations or gene, we're not meant to say mutations anymore, we call them gene variants. Um, and we look at the variants and see what that's predicted to do, i.e. is it disease causing, is it a clinical consequence that is variable. The commonest uh, mutation, sorry, I always will say mutations, but the commonest variant is Delta F508. That's the old name for it. It's also called Phi 508 Del, etc. 70% of CF variants are Delta F508. And two delta F508s, homozygous for delta F508, approximately 52% in the UK. So half the patients have got two delta F508s. And in fact, although I said there's over 300 disease causing, 29 of them account for almost 90% of the variants that we come across. It's a multi system disease, but the principal thing in the lungs, and that's why myself. I'm a paediatric uh, lung specialist, and actually most CF paediatricians are lung specialists. In the older times, i.e. 70s and 80s, there were some who were gastroenterologists principally. But uh, respiratory infection, bronchiectasis, damage to the lungs, respiratory failure ultimately is the commonest cause of death. Um, the gut is affected, the pancreas is insufficient, meaning that they can't make the enzymes to absorb fat, which is why uh, in times gone by, uh, you would have very, very skinny children, underweight, uh, malnourished basically, because of and now we just give them the enzymes and with everything they eat. And it really is everything apart from like a nice lolly or a piece of lettuce. Um, liver disease can happen because the bile ducts get clogged up. Men are infertile. Um, uh, the gut can get blockages, which can be only constipation or quite severe. Uh, other things, finger clubbing, toe clubbing, arthropathy, joint pains. Um, and now that people are living longer, we're finding increased cancers, particularly the pancreas and the gut. And in fact, adult centres are now doing screening colonoscopies regularly. Um, ENT issues, sinuses, polyps, little growths in the nose. And then, of course, there's psychological issues of the whole thing. So I've kind of just given you a bit of an overview. This really is a multi-system disease, although principally lungs and gut. And there's just a slide to show on the left, the yellow dots are Staph aureus and the green dots are rods of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They are the commonest bacteria. You can see a bronchoscopic pitch on the bottom left, which is very thick, sticky mucus. That's because the airways lining fluid is dehydrated. And ultimately on the top right, you'll see a CT scan showing bronchiectasis widening and damage of the airways. It's a neutrophil disease, hence the little picture of the neutrophil. 
and ultimately respiratory failure. Now, what about the prognosis before the modulator drugs? Well, when I was a medical student, people died, and that was in the uh, mid to late 70s, early 80s, people died in childhood. It was very unusual to have an adult with CF, which is why principally it's paediatricians who looked after this condition. There are currently almost 11,000 people in the UK with CF, and 62% are over 60, 16 and above. This was a landmark about four or five years ago when suddenly there were more adults and children with the condition. And this is crucial. And in uh, countries where they don't have proper CF services, um, it's still rare to see adults. And there are a thousand patients aged 40 plus in the UK. The median age of death is 38 years. Now, what that means is that's currently the commonest age people will die at is actually in their late 30s. And that's, of course, because they were born 38 years ago when the treatments weren't as sophisticated as they are now. The median survival is the figure at which half babies born today will live before, beyond that age. So before these modulators, the median survival currently was estimated about 47 years. That's still amazing if you think that half the people with CF will, will live longer than 47. Obviously, it's still not as good as a long life. The improvements have come about with better nutrition and, and efficient enzymes, aggressive antibiotic use, mucolytics, which are inhaled drugs to help reduce the stickiness of the mucus, uh, standardizing therapies and specialist centers. And then in 2007 in the UK, we've had newborn screening. That means that from this October coming, Everybody, all children with cystic fibrosis will have been born and diagnosed with screening and diagnosed at about four to six weeks of age, rather than delayed many years because people don't think of it and by which time their, their lungs are in bad condition, etc. So all these have helped before the advent of CFTR modulator therapy. And you can see here, this is just between 2007 and 2017, the median predictor survival, how it's improving. It is still worse for women than men. It's not 100% certain why that's the case, uh, but it's always an upward uh, um, graph. And if I showed you a longer period, you really would see the changes. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there are different types. The, the variants that we see cause different types of problems with the CFTR mutation. The commonest, as I mentioned, Delta F508 is, uh, is type two, uh, the third picture along where it says no traffic. And that's where essentially the CFTR doesn't actually make it to the cell surface. And what does make it doesn't work very well. The other one to highlight is type three, which are gating mutations where they get to the surface, but they don't work so efficiently. And the only other one to mention out of all this lot is the far left, where there's no protein with an X at the end. And that is important because those people, unfortunately, cannot benefit from the modulator treatment. It has a, no impact at all. So CFTR modulators are small molecules the drugs are small chemical compounds. They are easy and they're cheap to produce. About six thousand US dollars for a year's worth per person. So remember the six thousand dollars figure for when I tell you what the drugs cost. Potentiators are the types that increase the channel opening on the cell surface, and correctors increase the amount of CFTR that reaches the cell surface. And uh, this is important, again, in the types of drugs that we've been using. The CF Foundation essentially is the charitable organisation in the USA, which raises a lot of money you know, uh, very effectively. And a while ago, they, they collaborated with drug companies, uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, with a, a tactic of what was called high throughput drug screening. So every compound, every drug that uh, was currently available for any other condition, which is important because it means it speeds up the process because it's already been licensed. Um, they were looking for these compounds to see uh, in vitro 
the likelihood of whether uh, of changes in the CFTR protein would actually work and, and you'd get chloride transport. And they tested over 200,000 drugs, this mechanism. It was a fantastic project, really. And this is where we are now. And Vertex uh, company basically have a monopoly on all the drugs at the moment. There are other companies who are trying to come up with their own versions, but so far it's only Vertex drugs. And either Caftor, which is the drug name, so that's the name I will use, the trade name is Calideco. Um, and then we have, that's the first, then the next two are all Cambi and Simkevi, and you'll see they are either Caftor, and either Caftor is a potentiator, works better, whereas Luma Caftor and Teaser Caftor are correctors, to help, so you've got a dual therapy there getting the cell, getting them to the surface better and getting them to work better. And now we're using triple therapy, which is Ivacaftor, as, long, as well as two uh, correctors, Tezacaftor and Alexacaftor. And that's Caftrio, triple therapy. So Ivacaftor came along, and you can see the main public early publication in New England Journal of Medicine was in 2011. So we've had this drug for a while, it's for gating mutations. Initially, G51D was the uh, mutation because that's by far the commonest. These are Celtic genes, so much commoner in Ireland uh, and in the UK to an extent, but only 5% of patients with CF in the UK have a gating mutation. And some countries, for example, Portugal, they have hardly anybody with a gating mutation. Um, so, this drug uh, came along and the initial study is obviously 12 years and above. And you can see on the right hand side, now if you remember, if you look at the right hand lower, um, uh, lower graph, I mentioned about sweat chloride, 100 classic abnormal uh, sweat chloride for the placebo. And look what happened if you went on to either capital. Within a couple of weeks, the sweat chloride came below 60 into the 50s. That was astonishing at the time. It was it was remarkable that a drug could do that. Um, and the initial studies, as I say, were in 12 and above, as they always are with um, pharmaceutical studies, and then you have to wait longer for them to come further down. And it's a drug that's taken oral twice a day. And there's someone who had tattooed the chemical compound on their foot because they were so pleased they could get this medication. And in terms of other clinical things on the top left is lung function, which went up around 10%. Prior to this drug, randomized controlled trials of medications in CF, if it went up 5%, that was considered amazing. So this went up 10% for FEV1. The top right graph shows the exacerbation rate, i.e. when you're ill with an infection, how that uh, came down, was reduced on Ivacaftil. The bottom right is weight. The weight went up, uh, and that's often a big problem. Nutrition is a big problem for people with CF. And the bottom left is um, uh, a quality of life score, which also was improved. Then when they did the studies on younger children, i.e. next came six to 11-year-olds, they didn't have to do the efficacy so much. It was more about the pharmacokinetics and the safety. Were they the same as in the older children and adults? And that's because it's quite hard to measure uh, clinically in well asymptomatic young children who are too young to do lung function measures as well. What they found was the sweat chloride was reduced as you'd expected. The studies continued. And in fact, now if you're born with a gating mutation, you will go on to either aged age just four months before you've had any disease and infections in lungs, and this is a remarkable achievement. What is interesting is in the study for two to five year olds, the stool elastase uh, improved. Now, the stool elastase is an easy test and it marks, it, it, it's, it measures pancreatic function. In uh, CF, it's almost always less than 15, and you can see there that actually above 200 counts as norm, um, uh, is still abnormal, and above 500 
is completely normal. 200 to 500 is not bad. You'll get some pancreatic function. Less than 100, you're definitely not going to work. And what it showed is what was previously always assumed that your pancreatic ducts were blocked through in utero and through early childhood. They were never going to open up. Actually, some people's elastases went up quite remarkably, uh, quite a lot, showing that even pancreatic function wasn't irreversible. In practice, in UK, well, in England now, we're talking about, because as you know, we devolved health services. NHS England commissioned its use in 2012, but only for 5% of the patients, those with gating mutations. Interesting survivor guilt. Some of the parents felt quite bad that their child could get the drug and lots of other CF patients couldn't. Now, bear in mind this drug cost $6,000 to produce a year. The cost to the UK was £150,000 per year per patient. And that was actually reduced with a deal from £180,000, which is the equivalent of what it was costing in the US. And I can give you those figures because they are on the internet, uh, although at the time it was all hush-hush. The NHS England and obviously the drug company didn't want everybody in other countries to know what the UK were paying, but it all got on the internet, so we all know what the cost was. Now, this was acceptable to NHS England because there were only about less than 400 patients who were going to receive the drug, so the total bill was not enormous. Interestingly, adherence, which is a big challenge for us in CF, most children and adults don't take all their medications. It's boring, it's time consuming, they can't be bothered, they don't feel an obvious difference. And even a life-saving treatment, and it is life-saving, like I have a cath talk, one small study, admittedly only 12 people, where there was electronic, mon electronic monitoring of whether they opened the bottle in the first place, let alone swallowed it, the overall adherence was just 61%, and it ranged from 4 to 99%. So some people weren't even taking it, and it also got worse over four months' time. Of course, the patients all said they were taking it. Self-reporting was 100%. And I think this is interesting because this is going to be an increasing issue for someone who's born asymptomatic baby. Parents won't know what a CF disease is like because no one ever gets it anymore because they're all on these medications and they're being asked to give treatments twice a day, every day for the rest of that person's life. And I think adherence to long term treatment when you seem to be symptom free and are remaining symptom free will be the biggest challenge for CF over the next decades. Ibocaftor was shown to be disease modifying. This is important because it's one thing showing a randomized controlled trial that there's an improvement, but actually it's changing long term. And this was registry data from the UK and the US. At the time, the US had been using it for two years longer than we had. And you can see there are about 1,600 patients compared to 8,000 comparators that were matched. And what you can see on the thing there is the risk of death was reduced from 1.6% in a comparator, i.e. factory placebo group, to 0.6%. And transplantation rate went from 1.1% to 0.2%. And there were less exacerbations, less hospitalizations, fewer complications like diabetes and liver disease, fewer bacteria cultured from airways. And a further study, which was a five-year follow-up, show the same improvement in death and transplant. So it's actually modifying the disease. It wasn't just affecting how you are at the time. The next drug that came along was a combination either Cafta Lumacaftal. Now the importance of this and why it was a breakthrough is because it was for Delta F508 homozygous patients, which as I mentioned in the UK is half of the CF patients. So it was a breakthrough in principle of showing that something could help but it didn't work anything like as well as either CAFT or did or the gating. You'll see the lung function went up about 3%, which isn't exactly, you know, a game changer uh, compared to either CAFT or 10%. The exacerbation rate did come down by a third, which was important. So it worked a bit, but it cost even more. It was $259,000 per year per patient. And that's interesting because you assume that a drug that will be given to far more patients because more people have this variant and will be eligible will be cheaper. 
But no, the company put the price up high. Um, it got extended to six to 11 year olds with further trials. Now here, LCI is lung clearance index. It's because they're too young, some of them to do lung function. So it's another way of measuring. It measures ventilation around the lungs. It's not measuring flow like FEV1 is. But you can see even there, the FEV1 only went up two and a half percent. But the sweat chloride came down about 20. So still in the abnormal range. I'm just pointing to the lower part of this slide with all can be uh, showing how the younger you are, the greater the sweat chloride response that we found. So two to five year olds, there was median change was 32 compared to 12 years and above. So what happened? Nice rejected it. They said it's not cost effective for that price. It's not having a big enough effect in terms of lung function and potentially therefore you know, long term outlook, given though that the exacerbation rate was reduced. The CF community were outraged, basically. Now, most CF doctors did not object very strongly because we kind of thought this is incredibly expensive for not much. And actually, at the time, I remember we worked it out that if we gave someone uh, their own CF nurse and physio to visit once a day, we would definitely get their lung function improved more than two and a half percent, and it would be cheaper. Um, now, later on in 2019, it did get commissioned to be used, um, and the license came down from two years and above. And in fact, just a couple of months ago, it's now eligible for one year and above. But of course, these are people with the Delta F508 um, homozygous, um, and they're only going to get it till six years of age because. Triple therapy will be used from six, although very soon from two. So actually, the drug is, is becoming uh, a drug that will never be used or will never be used in a country where CAF-TRIO is available anyway. Subsequently, there was a, a Me Too drug, Simkevi, where it was a different teaser CAFTA instead of Lumacafta. The efficacy was similar to all can be. Lung function went up about 4%. Exacerbation rate went down 35%. Um, it is a safer drug, less drug interactions, and it was eligible to be used for Delta F508 homozygous or Delta F508 stroke residual function. And the residual function were milder mutations. Um, it's, it's available for six years and above and effectively is hardly used because anybody with those mutations who is six and above will get triple therapy, which is far more effective. And the cost went up even further, by the way, it's $292,000 per year per patient, a fortune for a drug that is really only improving lung function a few percent. Now, triple therapy, this was the big one. This was the one where we were talking to NHS England for a few years, having seen the phase two studies, knowing how the phase three trials were going, saying, don't worry about all can be. And don't worry about the parents with their placards outside Parliament. But do worry when triple therapy comes around, because with triple therapy, we knew that we CF physicians and paediatricians would be out there with the placards as well. Um, effectively, you take two tablets in the morning and one in the evening, and the results for the 12 years and above were absolutely astonishing. And this is for people with Delta F508. So this is meaning most CF patients will be eligible. Sorry, I just had to flip that, up. Okay, flip that back there. What did they see? Look at the lung function at the top left. FEV1 went up about 13% in those um, had Delta F508 on one gene and the other one was any one of the minimal function ones. And below um, is the change in FEV1 um, yep, for those with two to FF was two delta F508s. Exacerbation rate, you can see the right hand graph from placebo to the drug went down markedly, including those needing intravenous antibiotics and those uh, having to be in hospital. So incredible result for those who had either two delta F508s or one delta F508 and another minimal function variant. 
the sweat chloride went down uh, by about 45. That's the sweat chloride concentration change. Again, remarkable. BMI went up the weights. That's the Z. Um, yeah, that's the absolute change in BMI. So very encouraging for weight as well. And at the bottom, you can see the change in uh, sweat chloride for those with two delta F508s so went down over 45. It was slightly better. Inevitably, unfortunately, the uh, trials continued and in 2022 published the six to 11 year olds. Again, there we were using LCI with a mean change of 2.3. You just have to take it from me that that's a signif clinically significant change. That's the normal level for an LCI is, is to be under seven and a half, roughly. So a two and a half change is large. And the lung function went up for those who were able to do it by about 11%. Sweat chloride came down by five. Fantastic results. And then this, which has just appeared in the American Journal of Spiritual Critical Care Medicine uh, uh, three months ago, um, uh, is two to five year olds. In other words, the age is coming down and down that you can start the treatment. And this is important. The earlier you start the treatment, you will stop lung damage happening. It's an open label study because they only needed to look at safety and pharmacokinetics. And the sweat chloride mean came down by 59. So that's getting into almost the normal range for sweat chloride. Uh, LCI went down a little bit. But remember, these children are young and incredibly well to start with. Is safe and well tolerated. So, this is the one good thing from my perspective that came out of the pandemic is that there was great fear in the health services about people with cystic fibrosis. And if they caught COVID, would they basically all die and be very, very sick, take up lots of hospital beds, etc., which is, of course, was very important at the time. And I was part of a CF, uh, small CF pandemic group where there were three clinicians, uh, two pharmacists and some NHS England representatives. And um, we were uh, responsible for a, a, a very short, quick, nice guideline what to do for COVID and CF. Brought in home monitoring, video consultations. And throughout all of this, we were hearing, because of course it was way above our pay grade as to these decisions for commissioning the drug, that it was looking very encouraging that CAFTRIO was going to get licensed in the UK. And I reckon if it wasn't for the pandemic, there would be years of argument and delay and long, long drawn out process to whether we would have been able to use this drug, this life changing drug for SEER. So in June 2020, we were commissioned to start using it right in the middle of the early time of the pandemic. In the US, they'd started in the previous October, and we actually started prescribing in August 2020. And I have to tell you, it was very emotional, in fact, at that stage, prescribing this drug to patients. The six-year-old, we started in January 2022 because the NHS agreement was fantastic, which meant that if there was any change to the license, we could immediately start using it. We didn't have to go through the whole process again of commissioning and everything. And the two year olds, uh, just a couple of months ago in the US, they've started using it in April and we are hopeful through the, that it'll be licensed and then commissioned in this country um, a little bit later this year. And that means you'll be starting a two year old in CAF trio before they've really got sick and bad lung disease. And the other thing that's important is we are using it for anybody with one Delta F508 with any other variant on the other gene. So about 90% of patients in the UK are benefiting from CAF trio. And in fact, our experience at the Bronx is 95% uh, are on it who are eligible. And the importance also is the NHS England agreement and all praise to them for this is that we are able to use it if you don't have a Delta F508 
but you have a mutation that the FDA have licensed based on in vitro work. And there are about 177 of these variants where you might have two of them or one of them and another rare thing. If you have one of them, you are able to start on CAFTRIO, which is actually out of the drug company's license, in fact. Real world experience has been remarkable. Um, children who have been unwell are hugely better. Uh, those who started out well are actually, the one thing they say is they've got more energy, which I find fascinating because what is energy? You know, what is it that they feel? They just have more energy. They just feel more alive and better. Adults have been coming off transplant lists, stopping home oxygen, less hospital admissions. We used to always have a month's waiting time to get a CF patient in for IV antibiotics with eight patients in at all times. Now we have two or three in and you get in within a week or two. The other big change is appetite improvement because obviously it's affecting the gut mucosa and everything. And unbelievably, from being a disease of malnutrition, obesity is now becoming an issue. And that's because many of the patients have had a fairly high fat diet, which they've needed and been encouraged to have, and are now becoming obese because they actually have to change their eating habits now that they're on the medication. What I think was unexpected was the mental health effect and the mental health issues. Now, of course, confounding all of this was the pandemic and particularly in paediatrics, not going to school uh, has, as everybody will have heard, has had quite significant impacts on many, many children. The drug CAFTRIO probably has some dire direct effect on the brain, but there are other interesting things. Identity as a person with CF, and this is more for adults than paediatrics, I would say, Reevaluating their lives. Suddenly people need jobs. They have to think about pensions, new expectations, regrets over past decisions, not to go to university, not to make an effort to get a good job. Sadness over people they knew who've died before the medication came out. And this has become really something that's talked about a lot at CF conferences. Very recently, pub, um, it's come out in June only, oh, it's this month, isn't it? A new trial, phase two at this point only, showing a new corrector, Vanzacaftor, and a change to the Ivacaftor molecule, molecule, making it deuterated. And the importance of this is it's once daily. And in terms of adherence, once daily is a lot easier to take than twice daily. I have no doubt that the uh, phase three study will be ongoing now, and then there'll be a whole thing about should we switch CAFTRIO to whatever this drug is going to be called. Can the NHS afford this? We know that either CAFTRIO cost £150,000 a year. We don't know what CAFTRIO costs because it's all hush-hush and generally I have no idea. But if we assume it's £100,000, which is not an unreasonable assumption, and we know that 90% of 11,000 people are eligible, this is 9,900, I'm ignoring the age, I'm at the seaside, hence the seagull noise. I'm ignoring the age because it will be eligible for two years and above, and we're not down to four months. That's 990 million pounds per year spent on nearly 10,000 patients. Bear in mind the previous NHS England spend for CF for everything was only 226 million pounds a year. And now there's this massive bill on top. So. Praise for NHS England for making this happen. But you can see that there's, de de there's an element of inequity. And not only will you take the drug every day, you're going to take it for a long time. This is the new survival predictions recently published. So on the left hand side is age 12 to 17, meaning if you start the drug at 12, and you're on, just look at the red, that's all we're interested in, CAFTRIO. 82 years median predicted survival. That means they're suggesting half the people will live beyond 82. And if you started it, let's look at the right hand, age over 25. So you already have had lung disease for 25 years. The median prediction is still in the early 60s. And of course, it's going to be started from two years. So that 82 years is going to go up, I would suggest. So if you work it out, what it costs for one patient, 
is eight million pounds for the lifetime cost for one drug for one patient. Um, you might hope that that person has a full and useful for society life. Maybe I'm being controversial here, but if they sit and just play, uh, you know, TV video games on the sofa for 60 years, is that worth eight million pounds? I'll just like to throw that out there. Now, obviously, these drugs will go off patent and will become cheaper in time. But actually, they won't become much cheaper, probably, because if you're the second drug company and you can see what Vertex are charging, you'll charge less, but, you know, not necessarily a lot less. There are ethical issues here. Because I've talked about what's happening in the UK, which is similar to the US. Now, this is an interesting paper published last year. On the left in red are all patients believed to have CF worldwide. Now, obviously, there's a big uh, error bar there because you don't know people who are not diagnosed. It's estimated around 160,000. Diagnosed worldwide, 105,000, which is 65% of everybody predicted. Now, the green is those on uh, a CFTR modulator, just 12% of all the patients but actually, I think it's more useful to look at those diagnosed. And it's 18% of those diagnosed worldwide are being given this drug only. So about 80% cannot get access to these drugs because of the cost. Now, the CF Foundation, who partnered with Vertex, the charity, sold the royalties for these drugs and all future drugs for $3.3 billion in 2014 which is fairly astonishing the amount of money for uh, a charitable organisation to suddenly get $3.3 billion. They are putting lots back into research. But it gives you an idea of how much money Vertex think they're going to continue to uh, make. This is an interesting um, uh, paper that's impressed just this year. In green are countries where most of the CF patients have access. So you'll see US, Canada, Australia, and most of Western Europe have access to the modulators, a substantial amount. Red means they have lots of people with CF and they don't have the medication. So you can see how many uh, people are unable, countries are unable to benefit from these drugs. The yellow is limited access to so, uh, Brazil. They just have ivacaftol. They don't have any of the other medications yet. The pale blue is interesting, and that's Argentina. Argentina are making their own cheap generic version, uh, currently being sued by Vertex, going to go through the courts, and it will be fascinating what happens um, because they are making cheap versions of these modulators, as could anybody. They're very easy to make. And finally, in grey are there where there are not many people with CF um, and there's no real data. Now, the missing 10% are those eligible uh, who are not eligible because they don't have the right genes. Um, and it's very difficult for these people. So if you've got a stop mutation with an X, but the CF Foundation are putting uh, $500 million into research to try and uh, look after these people, in particular those with very rare mutations who are often, of course, ethnic minorities. I'm nearly finished, and I'm just gonna mention very briefly two other lines of approach. One is gene editing. I'm mentioning it briefly because I don't understand it, but basically you snip out a bit of the faulty uh, uh, CFTR uh, DNA, I mean, snip out a bit of DNA that contains the faulty CFTR mutations, replace it with a, a DNA um, and this is something that may work for the 10% and is one of the areas being looked at. The other thing is gene therapy itself which was something that was going full tilt at the UK. There's a lot of research into this before these drugs came out and the idea here is to insert the CFTR the gene that encodes for CFTR into the respiratory epithelial cells. So it is actually a twice day inhaled therapy. And uh, initially, initial studies were using viruses in the US, but people were forming antibodies to those viruses, so you couldn't keep using the treatment. And the, uh, in the UK, we were using liposome complexes. There was a randomized controlled trial with 140 people. And what you can see was there was a modest increase in lung function of about 3.7%. 
So it was a proof of principle that this might work. It worked a bit better. It was 6.4% improvement in FEV1 for the 50 to 70% of those who started with uh, worse lung disease. Now, if you bear in mind the second and third modulator drugs, they weren't getting an FEV1 uh, uh, change as good as 6.4%. So there is a signal there, and um, there's still hope. Um, and there's further trials going to happen in the UK in a consortium, CF con uh, consortium uh, using lentivirus. But I suspect we've got many years before this is likely to uh, come to fruition. So in conclusion, progress in CF has been astounding. Initially a disease of death in childhood, then death in young adults, and now there's discussions about CF geriatrics and how the adult respiratory units, we need more of them because we're increasing the number of adults all the time. The paediatric population size is approximately the same in the country, but adults, they're all becoming adults. We don't expect death in childhood. We don't expect transplants. Um, but obviously the missing 10%, uh, fortunately in our clinic, just 5% who aren't eligible, are still gonna have classic CF disease that we need to look after. And Again, across the globe, everybody with CF needs to have access to these treatments. And that is my last slide. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Ian. It was a truly excellent talk. Um, and I've got a couple of questions. Please do keep on posting them in the chat and we'll moderate them and I'll ask the ones I've moderated. Um, but to kick things off, one of the things you talked about in your talk is how actually the age at which these drugs are licensed at these modulators is constantly reducing. And I know from my own clinical practice as a pediatrician, these the A sometimes we're even diagnosing potential CF antenatally to antenatal screening in couples that we know are carriers. Could you envisage a point where even potentially a neonate could be started on these therapies, because surely that would be, in my untrained mind, I guess, and the person who asked this, that would be the age of most benefit because no lung damage would have occurred. So that's very interesting. I think, to be honest, you're diagnosed at about four weeks of age. You know, starting at four months is pretty good. Okay. Um, and I think it's a liver worry. The big side effect, and I haven't really gone into that, is, is liver function, um, essentially. And I think people are a little bit anxious, you know, uh, and, and you really, by form, I wouldn't expect you to have lung disease and grow pseudomonas. What is interesting you touched on there is about antenatal screening, because what's now happening in the adult world of CF is lots and lots of women with CF are having babies because these drugs have affected cervical mucus and uh, they were often sort of subfertile, so they could have babies if they were well. Um, and now they are getting pregnant, not always planned, um, as quite a significant thing. And there has been, there are case reports coming about. So um, the drug company, of course, have to say, well, if you're pregnant, you shouldn't take the drug because we don't have any information on teratogenic problems. So far, so far, so good is what I say. And many pay, uh, of the adults are electing to continue with the drug. Of course, you might choose not to have it the first trimester, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But then they often don't know they're pregnant, for, you know, unless it's planning and they're trying for pregnancy. But uh, there's been a case where a ba the mother was on Captrio, the baby had CF, presuming the father was a carrier, uh, missed on screening, obviously checked anyway, negative screening because the IRT was completely normal because the baby had effectively been receiving Captrio as um, an in, as an in, as yeah. antenatally. And this area is fascinating because. Mm. Would you, if you were a normal person who finds out you've got a baby with CF, would you start taking Caftrio through your pregnancy so that the baby came out probably pancreatic sufficient and in a better state? Um, that I have no answer for that one yet, but I'm just throwing it out for the geneticists because you're going to get involved with these sorts of discussions, I suspect, with parents sometimes. Yeah, and I think it, certainly in developmental disorders, that's another thing because a lot of the aberrations occur in utero. So actually, if some of these drugs do work across the placenta, one might say, actually, 
you, you may get a lot more salvage, I guess, than any of us would expect. So yeah, no, that's a really interesting case report, actually. I'll yeah. look that up. No, there's um, more and more about pregnancy in antenatally. It's, it's like a hot topic at the moment. Oh, awesome. Um, sorry, I keep on looking. My monitor is acting a bit funky, so I keep on looking to the side of my other monitor. So the next question I have um, is, I think, slightly technical. Um, so, and it goes along the lines of this. So to what degree do you think that the novel drug identification approach, and I think they mean the high throughput screening, the sort of molecular library, I guess, Vertex would call it, um, in vitro has revolutionized the treatment of CF, can be extrapolated and hopefully emulated in other di genetic diseases. And the example they've given here is haemophilia, for instance. Um, because I guess if you're using th massively throughput molecular screening, you're likely to identify potential agents in any other disease. Um, well, I can't obviously tell you how that might affect haemophilia. What I would say is, it, it you need an in you need a, a something a marker to measure, like you know the chloride channel mm. function in vitro. So you would need something like that as a starting point for haemophilia. But I think it's it's an interesting model, and I think it's uh, it's it's a good model because those drugs have already undergone safety trial. You know, your years you're speeding up the process by many many years and going to look for a novel drug. Um, but I would imagine that that there is potential in some other conditions. I would think it's quite likely. But then of course you're going to have to have someone spending the money to do it. It's not a cheap process. Well, it's all autom automated, and I guess. When this was happening, remember this was be, would have, I mean, this would have been happening from about year two thousand onwards. I'm sure the AI automation, the whole thing, is probably far more advanced now. Yeah, I mean, I guess my own work is in sort of in, in silico analysis of these things, so I guess that's going to hopefully drive down the cost as well, and um, because you aren't using actual drugs, you using sort of computational models, which we can do, I guess, more cheaply. But then you still need to do the in vitro testing, of course, before you do any in vivo testing. So I guess we will see what the total cost implication is as we find out more. OK, the next question um, I've just published in the chat, actually, um, is at present, prenatal testing and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is offered for CF in the UK and licensed by the HFEA. Do you think we have reached a stage when the significance of CF on lifespan may negate the need for either testing? That is very mm. interesting. Yeah. Because I would have said before um, CFTR drugs came out, even if someone said to me, I, I, you know, I have an antenatal diagnosis of CF, should I have a determination? Not that anybody did ever. You know, they wouldn't come to somebody like me, but they would speak to their obstetrician. Um, I think I got to the stage where I thought, actually, you know, treatments are pretty good. Most children and young adults are leading a good quality of life. Yes, it's a pain. There's lots of medications and physio they have to do twice a day. But I wouldn't have said, oh, I think this is a terrible disease. And I mean, it's a very personal issue. But for me, if I'd have had a child with anencephaly, I think I would have thought a termination was appropriate. If I'd have had a child with CF, I would not. Now, with the CFTR modulator therapies, assuming they're on the right, they've got the right variants that they would be eligible, I don't think there will be any cause for termination personally. Although I know some people want perfect, they don't have blue eyes or they want a boy or a girl. I mean, that's a whole other ethical, ethical side to it. Um, I still think if you have a child with cf it is still a big deal for that parent you know you have an expectation in life of a normal child living a normal lifespan and you know not everyone is going to tolerate the drugs side effects some people sometimes even now we sometimes have to stop them and restart at a lower dose and build it up etc so i think one is entitled to pre-implantation diagnosis even in the current modulator era i would suggest um, I've got a, a very interesting question, actually, and I've, I've got to say I've published one which I'm going to say is probably a bit of a minefield, um, which goes which the comment says fascinating talk. Thank you. And I wholeheartedly concur. This may be out of scope, and I think it probably is out of the scope of linkage, but I think it's an important point. Um, 
Is there any legislation in place to curb the price hikes of life-changing therapies such as CAF trio? I know in the States, following the whole insulin sort of problems they've had and the you know the price hikes that happened with that, there has now been legislation, I think, from the start of this year that has saved quite a few lives. Are you aware of anything like that in the UK? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Currently, yeah. there's any legislation, but of course there is effective legislation because NICE will, in the UK, will look at it and basically will say no, like they did with all can be. If they say no, you can't prescribe it. It's yeah. not, you can't get it. So there is effective legislation. I mean, this is a huge area where actually society needs to take grip. Now, I'm not, you, I've probably come across as anti-vertex. I'm not. They've done a fantastic thing. They have changed the life of all my CF patients. Mm. But on the other hand, they became kind of hero to zero very quickly when they announced the price. And there's still a lot of angst, uh, feeling that they don't need to charge this much on a drug that is effectively cheap. Now, I know they have shareholders and I know they say, well, if we don't have money, we can't do clinical trials. They are expensive and we can't research. So I accept there's a balance, isn't there? And I think they've gone too far one way. Um, I mean, the most expensive drug I'm aware of is for SMA type one gene therapy. Yeah, new synergy. But then I, we at the Bronx, and we also look after SMA children yeah. who are non invasive ventilation. I've not yet seen someone as a result of it, but we've seen people who've had new synergy treatment suddenly sitting up yeah. things. So actually, it's remarkable. But I mean, this is society as a whole, isn't it? You know, because for the same money for one person with CF, you could do a lot of hip transplants. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, uh, you know, hip replacements. I mean, sorry, not transplants. Yeah. You know, it's it's a very tricky issue. Yeah. And I think the funding is actually extremely important. I mean, and it's interesting that you mentioned SMA type one and UCNS, and I've literally just seen a child with it two hours ago. Um, and this is why I'm slightly late to this, um, to the sort of pre-talk um, briefing we had. But the last one that I've just posted and published in the group is goes along the lines of this. Interesting point about the perceived duty of patients to make the most of their health. And I think this was a very important point that you made. And actually, I can see how if someone, you know, if their life expectancy was 35, 38, they may not have the same stimulus as if their life expectancy is now 80. I mean, hypothetically speaking, to achieve a lot with their life, I guess, academically or otherwise. So does this not by extension also apply to every individual receiving free health care? And I think that's a very loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, Would those pay <laughs> for the drug out of I mean, pocket I, have more freedom? I mean, <laughs> I, no, I, I'm not sure I can really comment on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll this is a man's trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but I, know what you, I mean, I have thought, you know, if the guy ends up as a burglar or a child molester. I mean, I, you know, but then there's, of course, degrees of, you know, you could say, well, if you smoke, you know, I, when I was a, a junior doctor in the surgical ward um, and uh, people were having vascular um, complications, you know, claudication, meaning they couldn't walk without terrible pain, getting gangrene in their feet and they would have surgery and the surgeon wouldn't operate if they smoked. But of course, they would just say, I've stopped smoking. And of course, they start smoking. And when they start smoking, you knew that that archer graft was going to fail yeah so i, I do think there should be some personal responsibility but mm -hmm. i'm not sure that anybody's able to make that judgment as to yeah. what that you know i think it's a very it would be a very arbitrary extremely ethically dangerous line to draw yeah. but it's i mean i think that's an that last question i think is probably a hundred and fifty billion pound question. If you look at the NHS's <laughs> annual budget, I think a lot of people think along the uh, think about that at a very high level already. But I have to say thank you so much for an extremely interesting talk, and I have to say a very stimulating Q and A. We're just going to pop up um, the closing slide, which has a QR code to this R6 linkage webinar. Again, thank you, Dr. Balfour Lynn. It's been an absolutely great talk. Um, please do go to the QR code. Thank you again.